there isn't much that we don't serve here. Hot and cold buffets with everything from entrees to desserts. Fresh carved turkey, ham, and rib roast. On top of that, you can order steaks, chops, chicken, and salmon hot off the grill. And that doesn't even count breakfast. We've got a big kitchen. Everything we got going on keeps it going full tilt all the time. They really have to stay on their toes in there. And so do I. I've been with Charlie's for as long as I can remember. I started on the floor and worked my way up. And along the way, I must have taken every food safety course that corporate had to offer. And that's on top of all the management and training courses that I've taken. I wanted to cover as much as I could because there's a lot to know, a lot to watch out for, and a lot of knowledge to pass on to my staff. I learned two basic lessons early on way back when. The first was to develop 2020 vision with the eyes in the back of my head. And the other was to train my staff right so I can rely on their skills and their eyes to keep our food safe and the operation running smoothly. Because after we've safely received and stored all our food, it has to be prepared, cooked, cooled, reheated, and served with just as much care and attention to detail. We have to do that because the risk of cross-contamination and time temperature abuse are the greatest at those particular points in the flow of food. To prevent these risks, you're going to need to know how to thaw food, how to prepare specific food, how to cook food, and about the cooking requirements for specific types of food. You'll also need to know the proper way to cool food, reheat food, hold food, and serve food. Let's start with food that you've just taken out of the freezer. When you thaw frozen food, it's exposed to the temperature danger zone. And just like that, any foodborne microorganism present will begin to grow. To prevent this growth, you need to make sure that food is never thawed at room temperature. There's only four acceptable methods for thawing potentially hazardous food, which is also known as food that needs time and temperature control for safety, or TCS food for short. You can thaw food in a refrigerator at 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, or lower. You can submerge it under running potable water at a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, or lower. You can do it in a microwave oven, but only if the food will be cooked immediately after thawing and you can do it as part of the cooking process. Just remember that the product has to meet the required minimum internal cooking temperature. Preparation is the next step in the flow of food in your operation, and you have to take precautions here too. Let's start with salads containing food that need time and temperature control for safety, such as salads with chicken, tuna, egg, pasta, and potato in them. These have all been involved in foodborne illness outbreaks. Since these salads are not typically cooked after they've been prepared, you don't have the chance to eliminate microorganisms that may have been introduced during preparation. But if you follow these preparation guidelines, you'll minimize the risk associated with them. First, if you're using leftovers to make salads like pasta, chicken, or potatoes, make sure you've eliminated any potential hazards. That means that these ingredients should only be used if they've been cooked, held, cooled, and stored properly. And you should also make sure that they haven't been kept past the use-by date. Food that needs time and temperature control for safety also includes eggs and egg mixtures, since they're able to support the rapid growth of microorganisms. If you're preparing egg dishes requiring little or no cooking, you should consider using pasteurized shell eggs or egg products. You can do that for dishes such as mayonnaise, eggnog, Caesar salad dressing, and hollandaise sauce. If you mainly serve high-risk populations, use pasteurized eggs or egg products when serving dishes that are raw or undercooked. Shell eggs that are pooled must also be pasteurized. You may use unpasteurized shell eggs if the dish will be cooked all the way through, such as an omelet or a cake. When you're preparing produce, you need to closely follow these guidelines. You have to make sure fruit and vegetables do not come in contact with surfaces exposed to raw meat and poultry. 
so you need to prepare produce away from raw meat, poultry, eggs, and cooked and ready-to-eat food. And you should clean and sanitize the workspace and all utensils you're going to use during preparation. After that, you have to wash fruit and vegetables thoroughly under running water so you can remove dirt and other contaminants. Only after you've done that can you start cutting, cooking, or combining them with any other ingredients. And you have to pay particular attention to leafy greens, such as lettuce and spinach. Dirt and other contaminants can hide between the leaves, so you should always remove the outer leaves and pull the items completely apart, then rinse them thoroughly. Now, let's move on to cooking. The only way to reduce microorganisms in food to safe levels is to cook it to the required minimum internal temperature. Now, this temperature must be reached and held for a specific amount of time. This temperature will vary from product to product. Use a thermometer with a suitable sized probe to make sure that the product has reached its required minimum internal temperature for a specific amount of time. Now remember, I'm talking about the internal temperature of the food, not the temperature setting for an oven. When checking temperatures, always check in the thickest part of the food, taking at least two readings in different locations. Remember, while cooking can reduce the number of microorganisms on food to safe levels, it will not destroy spores or toxins they may have produced. That's why it's really critical to handle food safely before it's cooked. That way, spores and toxins don't have time to form. Now there's different cooking requirements for specific types of food. For all poultry, that includes whole or ground chicken, turkey and duck, cook to a minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, for 15 seconds. If you're making stuffed meat, fish, poultry, and pasta, you need to cook it until the food reaches a minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, for 15 seconds. And when you're cooking ground meat, such as hamburgers or sausage, you should cook it until it reaches the minimum internal temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 Celsius for 15 seconds. If you're cooking injected meat like brine ham and flavor injected roast, you have to cook it until it reaches the minimum internal temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 Celsius for 15 seconds. For pork, beef, veal, and lamb, make sure you cook steaks and chops to a minimum internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, 63 Celsius for 15 seconds. For roast, you need to cook them until they reach a minimum internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, 63 Celsius, and hold at that temperature for four minutes. Fish should be cooked until it reaches a minimum internal temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, 63 Celsius, for 15 seconds. There's different guidelines for eggs, and they can be divided into two different categories, immediate service and hot held. If you're preparing them to serve right away, they should be cooked to a minimum internal cooking temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, 63 Celsius, for 15 seconds. But if they're going to be hot held for service, they should be cooked to a minimum internal temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 Celsius, for 15 seconds. When you're cooking food that needs time and temperature control for safety, like eggs, poultry, fish, and meat in the microwave, its minimum internal temperature should be 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius. Be sure to cover the food and rotate or stir it halfway through cooking. And after cooking, let it stand at least two minutes to let the temperature even out. But there's more than cooking temps to watch out for. Cooling is just as important. Food that needs time and temperature control for safety must be cooled from 135 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 to 21 Celsius within two hours. And then from 70 degrees to 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to five Celsius or lower in the next four hours. Remember, this is a two-stage process, two hours plus four hours. Both stages are very important and it's critical that you keep your eye on the clock, especially during the first stage. That's because while microorganisms grow well in the temperature danger zone, they grow much faster at temperatures between 125 degrees and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 52 and 21 Celsius. 
so food must pass through this temperature range quickly to minimize this growth. Cooling the food to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, within two hours allows it to pass quickly and safely through the most dangerous part of the temperature danger zone. But if food hasn't reached 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, within two hours, you have to either throw it out or reheat it and cool it again. Keep in mind that if you can cool the food from 135 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 to 21 Celsius, in less than two hours, you can use the remaining time to cool it to 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius or lower. However, the total cooling time cannot be longer than six hours. For example, if you cool food from 135 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 to 21 Celsius, in one hour, you have the remaining five hours to get the food to 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius or lower. As always, check your local regulatory requirements. These are reliable times and temperatures, but make sure you check them against your local requirements. Now, when you're talking about cooling food, let's start with the big don't. You should never place large quantities of hot food in a refrigerator to cool. That's because refrigerators are designed to keep cold food cold. Most are not designed to cool hot food quickly. Besides that, placing hot food in a refrigerator may raise the internal temperature of the cooler. You can be warming up the interior and putting all the food stored there at risk. Before you start cooling food, you should begin by reducing its size to more workable portions. This allows it to cool faster. So cut large food items into smaller pieces or divide large containers of food into smaller containers or shallow pans. Once you've done that, there's a number of ways to cool food quickly and safely. Now here's the three most common methods. One, you can put the food in an ice water bath. You divide the food into smaller containers, then place them into a sink or large pot filled with ice water. Then stir the food frequently to cool it faster and more evenly. Two, food will cool even faster if you stir it with an ice paddle. An ice paddle is hollow, so it can be filled with ice or with water and then frozen. Three, you can place food in a blast chiller or tumble chiller. Now blast chillers move cold air across food at high speeds to remove heat. They're especially useful in chilling large quantities of food like mm, several pans of chili. Whenever you can, use a combination of these methods to cool food quicker. That's enough on cooling. Proper reheating of food has to be done just as carefully. Food that needs time and temperature control for safety that has been previously cooked then reheated for hot holding, must be moved through the temperature danger zone as quickly as possible. You'll need to reheat it to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, for 15 seconds within two hours. If the food hasn't reached this temperature within two hours, throw it out. With all the buffet service we have here, proper food holding is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So, let me go over the general rules with you that you've got to follow to keep your food safe. Regularly check the internal temperature of both your hot and cold food using a calibrated thermometer fitted with the appropriate type of probe. Cold food that needs time and temperature control for safety must be held at an internal temperature of 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius or lower and hot food that needs time and temperature control for safety must be held at an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 Celsius or higher. But remember, never reheat food in equipment that isn't designed to do it. For example, you shouldn't use the steam table to reheat any food products. You've also got to check the temperature of food at least every four hours. If the food is not at the proper temperature, you have to throw it out. If you want to avoid wasting food, you should do what I do and check the temperature every two hours to leave time for corrective action. This might sound basic or obvious, but always cover the food to protect food from contaminants. The covers also help maintain the internal temperature of food. After handling food safely and cooking it properly, you don't want to risk contamination when serving it. That means training your kitchen and service staff properly and setting standards and procedures for any self-service areas. 
you need to train your staff to follow these procedures for serving food safely. Your staff should only use clean and sanitized utensils for serving. And they should use separate utensils for each food item, then clean and sanitize them properly after changing serving tasks. On top of that, the utensils should be cleaned and sanitized at least once every four hours during continuous use. You need to take every measure to minimize bare hand contact with food that's cooked or ready to eat. Your staff should handle food with tongs, deli sheets, or gloves. Some regulatory authorities allow bare hand contact in an operation if they've received prior approval. To do this, they must first outline policies for employee health and training in hand washing and personal hygiene. Check your local regulatory requirements to see if this applies to your operation. You also have to establish and enforce safe food handling practices with everybody on your staff. Everyone should take care to handle glassware and dishes properly. They shouldn't touch the food contact areas of plates, bowls, glasses, or cups. When a server holds a dish, they should do it holding the bottom or the edge. Cups should be held by their handles, and glassware should be held by the middle, bottom, or stem. They should also be careful to hold flatware and utensils at the handle. And make sure your flatware storage area is set up so servers grasp handles, not food contact surfaces. When your servers are getting ice, they should use ice scoops or tongs to do it. And they should never scoop ice with their bare hands or use a glass or cup because it might chip or break. It's also important to remember to store ice scoops in a sanitary location and not in the ice. The last area I want to talk about is self-service. Now, I know from experience that buffets and food bars can be a real challenge. That's because so many people have no idea how easy it is for food to be contaminated. A lot of our work here is protecting the customers from themselves. The best way to prevent contamination in the buffet area is to have it monitored closely by employees trained in food safety. You should follow these guidelines to prevent contamination and time temperature abuse. Remember to use sneeze guards or food shields to protect the food on display. The sneeze guards should be located 14 inches, 36 centimeters above the food counter, and shields should extend 7 inches, 18 centimeters beyond the food. You also need to identify all food items on the buffet. That means labeling all the items on your food bar. Lastly, customers can't be allowed to refill soiled plates or use soiled flatware at the food bar. Like I said before, there's a lot to know and a lot to watch out for. The busier it gets, the more closely you have to pay attention to the details. And I mean all the details. Sometimes it seems like you have to keep one eye on the time and the other eye on the temperature and the eyes in the back of your head watching everything else. So train your people right. I mean, they can be a lot of help to you. Every one of them is like an extra pair of trained eyes.